Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, it's Hugo Award time again. Every year, I try to read as many of the Hugo Award books that catch my interest. But you were nominated books for that year that catch my interest, short stories and that sort of thing, and give my thoughts on them. This year, of the five books, we have the entire Wheel of Time series, which... Yeah, no, I'm not gonna have time. I'm not gonna have enough time to read all of that. Um, we have a book by Larry Correa, who used some kind of obnoxious politicking to get himself and also another really nasty, vile person named Vox Day on the list of nominees. So I'm not gonna be reading that. We have another one of Shane and McGuire's um, books. Um, I believe this is Shane and McGuire as um, Mira Grant, do another vampire, do another um, zombie apocalypse kind of thing. And as I've mentioned before, I've kind of mostly been zombied out. Um, I'll have to look up the, I'll also have to look up the, yep, it's a, it's a Mira Grant book, so this is going to be a zombie apocalypse kind of thing. And it's not really catching my interest. So that leaves me with Anne Leckie's book, And Sorry Justice, which I'm reviewing today, and Neptune's Brood by Charles Strauss, uh, which I'll be reviewing a little later. So, let's talk about And Sorry Justice. It is the first novel from Anne Leckie. Um, as with all Hugo Award nominees, it is a very recent release. It came out last year. So I'm not going to be going into details here. I don't want to spoil anything. I want you, um, all these reviews are done with the intent of getting you to read the book. Or not read the book if I think it's bad. Um, it is an interesting book. In, interesting in the good sense. Um, it's also one which I'd say doesn't necessarily adapt well to would adapt well to a visual medium. Um, I'll explain in a bit. The book is something of a space opera. It follows Justice of Torin 1-esque. It is a, a ancillary of the warship Justice of Torin. It's from the uh, Justice of Torin is a warship of the Radish em, Radich R-A-D-C-H Empire. Um... I really don't know how to pronounce that. Kind of made me wish there was an audiobook of this. Um, and all their warships use artificial intelligences. And one of the things they frequently do is they have ancillary soldiers. These soldiers who are known, also called by the territories which are occupied by the Empire as corpse soldiers, are basically humans who have been heavily cybernetically augmented and are basic are 100 percent controlled by their ship, whatever ship they're on. Um, they have no free will. They have no consciousness either. So it's not like somebody trapped in the mind of a soldier and looking out while while it does things it objects to or anything like that. Um, so something happened to Justice of Torin which caused the ship to be destroyed and 1-Esk to be the only survivor. So, 1-Esk is now going out and seeking to basically assassinate the emperor of the Redditch Empire um, as, part of, as revenge for its destruction. And there's a lot more to it than that, but kind of the first half of the book is the in sort of this much investigation, but through flashbacks, we see what Justice of Torrin's life was like back when it was a warship, what led to the destruction of the ship, why it was destroyed, and why it is seeking revenge, and what the leader of the Empire, Ander Minai, um, did to make her worthy of death. I think important mention here is this part of the reason why I say it's somewhat unfilmable or somewhat unadaptable to visual medium is just, is the language of the Radich Empire doesn't put a lot of focus on 
gendered pronouns. Um, the sort of default pronoun for the language is her. Um, and so it leads to interesting assumptions as a reader as far as what gender a person is. Um, as a consequence, this, does, this makes the work not work as well for live action because you're having a gendered cast. Um, and so you lose some of the effect of, I'm assuming this character is, of going, oh, I assume this character is female, unless, until a moment happens where I realize, oh, this character is in fact actually male. Or that sort of thing. As opposed to the usual sort of gender assumption reveal where, oh, I assume this character is male, until something happens to reveal, oh, this character is in fact female. Or something similar. Um, and it makes things interesting narratively. Um, I'd probably say that this was going to be adapted to any sort of visual medium. Um, probably work better for like anime or manga, just because character designs in anime or manga tend to handle androgynous characters. Oh, anime, manga, or comics. Um, because the way to provide that sort of for lack of a better term, visual, um, to, to, to promote the sort of assumption in the reader would be to have the characters of something of an androgynous design. And those things work better in comics, animation, or in you know, comics or animation than in a live action form where it's hard to find a lot of androgynous people, people who look androgynous convincingly well without getting into lots of heavy costume work or heavy, or potentially very uncomfortable makeup or costume design work. Um, so, and also even in those cases, if you have a name actor in there, unless the name actor is one who, let's see, you have a name actor and you already know that name actor is gender. Um, unless it's a name actor who is known for playing an androgynous roles, in which case you can kind of roll with it more and, and, and have some doubt, doubt on whether even if this character is played by a male actor or a female actor, there can still be some question, like Tilda Swinton, for example, or on the male side of things, though he's got David Bowie in his younger years, for example. Um, other than that, the narrative is very crisp. It flows very fast. Um, the prose is excellent. Um, the pronoun bit doesn't actually cause any sort of major problem. Um, It's an excellent book. It, it, it really, really deserves its Hugo nomination, and it's already won a Nebula Award, and I can just tell why. And this is particularly more impressive because this is a first off, this is a first book, first novel by this author. Um, and I'm not gonna say you don't see that often in terms of first novels getting big awards, but I like to think it's it's. It's a sign of, good, of good things to come, and I'll definitely be kind of putting Anlecki on my "Let me know when the next book comes out" list on uh, Goodreads. Um, so next book is again. Uh, I have it right over there. I'm actually listening to an audio book right now. Um, next book is Neptune's Brood by Charles Strauss. I'll be discussing that when it's done. Um, as far as next show of Breaking It All Down goes, so got, I've got the script and everything together for Max Payne 3 review. It's going to be a full proper review as opposed to a more informal vlog thing like what I've got now. Um, currently working on uh, Diablo 3 and capturing gameplay footage for that. This will be the, uh, so expect something of that in the future. Uh, yeah, this episode's pretty short, so once we'll discuss something else real quick.
I watched all three episodes, well, all four plays, rather, three, four, four episodes of The Hollow Crown. This was a BBC miniseries done in 2012 for the Olympic, 2012 Olympics, an adaptation of one of the, of, um, Shakespeare's history cycles. Um, Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V. Very, very good, very enjoyable. I had never seen Henry the Fourth Parts One and Two adapted, nor Richard the Second. I'd been familiar with quotes from both of them, but I'd never actually seen the plays performed. They are very well staged and very well done. The casting is fantastic um, for all these. My only objection to this at all, and I'm trying to cut this short, is um, in the adaptation of Henry the Fifth, not related to acting or staging. Um, they have, they keep casting continuity from their adaptation of Henry the Fourth, which has Tom Hiddleston as, Pri as Prince Hal, and they, in Henry the Fifth they have him continue on to play Hen to play Henry. Um, my, again, the staging is excellent, casting is excellent, um, everything works incredibly well, except for the one issue that they make cuts from the play. And I understand you need to make cut scenes from the play for, in order for adapting to the screen and time constraints and that sort of thing. The cat making her way into my room. Um, my office. And I understand needing to make adaptations and cuts for, you know, the screen. But the cuts that were made are significant for the film's narrative for the narrative of the play. And the scenes they cut, compared to the scenes they, they leave in, lead to some incomprehensibility related to... And look, there's a cat. Related to the film's plot, the film plot, the play's plot. I do recommend that you see it, though. And if you get a chance... If you get a chance, to check it out. There's a second season coming out. With in the future, it's been announced. Uh, it's going to be adapting Henry the Sixth, parts one, two, and three, and Richard the Third, with Benedict Cumberpatch announced as Richard, which should lead to a very, very interesting performance. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that. So, in order to prepare for that, I recommend checking out the Hollow Crown. Um, so that's my review of *Ancillary Justice*, my brief vloggy review of *The Hollow Crown*. And I will have a review of Neptune's Children at some point in the future, as well as additional reviews of the novellas, novelettes, short stories. I'll probably even do and as I'm as I'm now doing a fanzine, um, I'll do a discussion of the fanzine nominees as well. So I will see you next time.